Thanks for listening to the Old Pueblo New Economy podcast with Aaron Eden, Julie Bonner, and Nick Morin. Each episode, we showcase the diverse entrepreneurs and leaders driving growth in the desert we call home. I'm your host, Julie Bonner, for this creative community episode. I'm an artist, designer, and marketing director, and I'm speaking with creative entrepreneurs right here in Arizona. My goal is that you can apply some of these lessons learned into your own best practices. Let's turn up the creativity. Community Investment Corps, located in Tucson and serving Southern Arizona, empowers small business owners with knowledge and access to capital. CIC believes in economic inclusion and supports entrepreneurs and small business owners at all stages with the practical resources and education they need to thrive and turn dreams to reality. CIC is a proud founding sponsor of this podcast. You are guaranteed a good time at a Bob Log show. His innovative musical setup, rocking guitar, and insane charisma ignites the party vibe in all of us. Hear how he went from playing the sidewalks in downtown Tucson to touring all over the world during the past 25 years. This interview is full of entertaining origin stories, crazy show mishaps, and inspiring advice for other musicians. Get ready to be extremely entertained by the one and only Bob Log. Hi, I'm Julie Bonner here with Old Pueblo New Economy, and this is Bob Log. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Hi, Julie Bonner. Good to, good to see you. So I've seen one of your shows back in the day, probably a long time ago in Tucson. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm a drummer, and uh, my co-host Aaron Eden connected me to you, so I'm thankful that you're here today. And I wanted to give a little background for our listeners. Many of the people here in Tucson know who you are, but for those that don't, how did you get started in music? I guess when I was 11 years old, uh, I started to play guitar and it was so much fun and said, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I, I just pick up a guitar and I have as much fun with it as possible. And when it gets to the point where the fun is ridiculous, then that's a song. That's and awesome. That's how I learned to play guitar when I was 11. And I don't think I've changed my approach one tiny bit since then. That's great. I, what I remember from the show I went to is that I had a really good time. And so I think uh, that comes across in your music and in your shows. How did you uh, first get into Actually, let's talk about how you became the one man band. I heard it was kind of a quick, quick pivot. Um, from where you were, could you let people know how that happened? Yeah, well, um, I mean, when when I was first playing music, yeah, I was in a band in Tucson called Mondaguano. We had a great time uh, making some really weird music that got the weird people dancing was kind of the idea. Uh, then I was in a two-man band called Durag, and we would play on the sidewalk outside of Walgreens downtown to try and get enough money for cigarettes and lemonade. Um, then various bands liked to do rag a lot and ended up taking us on tours all over the place, which was fun for us to do. Um, and then basically, yeah, like, uh, I suppose any, um, couple, (laughs) one of us wanted to do it more than the other. So I had a choice of, um, either stopping playing guitar because my drummer wasn't there or figuring out an entirely new way to play drums. And I decided to keep playing guitar and figure out a different way to play drums. Right. And, and those that, so there'll be audio file and also video file of this interview for those that are on audio that haven't seen um, your setup. uh, You have a telephone microphone built into your helmet and you're playing drums with both of your feet. One looks like usually the bass drum, the other is kind of a cymbal sort of tambourine. Yeah, so there's a, well, there's six things I do with my feet. So I play drums without using my hands at all. It's, it's like the Death Leopard drummer who only uses one arm, except I use no arms. Crazy. And um, so I play drums basically differently than, than anybody who's ever played drums, or at least, yeah, so it, I, I kick a kick drum, and then I kick a, it's a kick cymbal. I've taken a, a drum pedal and turned it facing down, and it's hitting a cymbal that's on the ground. Then I've got a broken drum machine, but I can trigger a hand clap with it. So I step on this thing and I can make a hand clap sound. And then I got another broken drum machine, but I make it so it can trigger the sound of what I call a super kick. So then I've got two kick drums going there. I got the real kick and then this that I can trigger with my foot.
foot. So these are all manually triggered um, foot drums. And then I've got a drum machine that is not broken that I can put in a simple drum beat. So it'll just be like, and I just turn that on and off whenever I want. And then another drum machine, which will have either a syncopated beat to the first beat that's in the other drum machine, but I have to step on it correctly or they, they get warbly. But the thing is, I like it when my rhythms are warbly. So I'm striving for this. I don't want a perfect drum beat. I want it to go like a rubber band. I want it to be a little bit wrong because I've noticed that whenever there's something wrong with the drums, you have to pay attention. You are riveted. If the drums are perfect, I can completely ignore the song. But if there's something slightly wrong with the beat, I can't look away. And um, that's what I'm striving to do with the drum beats. I'm trying to sound like a good drummer and a bad drummer that don't like each other and are having a fight. That's awesome. Then when I play guitar, I'm trying to play guitar differently than everybody, too. I, I mostly don't use a pick. And I do, I guess some people would call them banjo tricks. But I treat the guitar like almost like another drum. It's a percussive sound. There's not a lot of melody going on. It's melody and me, we're, we got an iffy relationship. But me and rhythm, we're, um, we're all right. So I trick the guitar like another drum. I'm playing it in these backwards, sideways rhythms to my warbly rhythms of the drum beats, <clears throat> which will eventually create this thing that makes people dance whether they want to or not. That's the plan. That's and the then I sing totally differently than everybody else because for me, singing is secondary to the guitar. Um, and I sing through a telephone, but really it's also because I like the sound of a telephone. You know, if you think about a telephone, it's perfectly designed for the tones of a human voice where, and we talk to each other on telephones all the time, what we don't talk to each other on Sure 58s all the time. So I think telephones sound better for the, uh, vocal sound that I'm going for, which I'll be honest, isn't much. But <laughs> when you mix that in with the drums, the warbly drums and the, the sideways guitar, um, it creates a party that sometimes people do things that they don't think they would normally do. And then we all get to talk about them tomorrow. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, and I, I give you props because I can play drums. I can sing a little backup, but definitely not do all of the things you're doing at once like holding down the percussion and then playing a melody and singing and also entertaining the crowd all at the same time so props for figuring that out and also you have this long career thus far it's been a lot of years you put out a lot of songs and you've toured all over for those that don't know so so you ride in a boat kind of crowd surfing on top during the show when did the boat thing start Oh, uh, that was for a very special day, actually. Um, there's this amazing town uh, in the northwest of America called Bellingham, Washington. Okay. And it's this tiny little college town, um, but it's just one of the most fun, ridiculous places to play on planet Earth. And there was a club there called the Triple B, and uh, played there many times. And uh, I mean, there's, there'd be a whole book written about Bellingham. When when they like what you're doing, they throw liquid. <laughs> so in my previous shows there, it's gotten to the point where I had to wear a poncho, like taping umbrellas to my helmet. Um, people throw so much beer and things that the stage is just a pool. Um, one time my kick drum sounded funny, and I looked, oh, what's going on? And I looked, and someone had crawled inside it and was just living in my kick drum while I played this whole entire show. <laughs> but aside from that, so... Yeah, Bellingham's just nuts. But um, so Bellingham, the trip to B, was going to close forever. And uh, they called me, and this would have been, oh boy, maybe 2005, mm -hmm. something like that. Anyway, they, uh, they sent me an email, said, Bob, trip to B's closing forever. We want you to play the last show. We will fly you from Tucson to get up here and play this show. And I was like, guys, that's great, but I just moved to Melbourne, Australia. You know, this isn't a, $300 ticket now. It's more like $2,000. And they were like, just a second, email me five minutes back. And they said, okay, we'll fly you from Melbourne. Wow. <laughs> so I said, okay, you're going to fly me that far to play one show. I got to do something. So on the way there on the airplane, I didn't sleep. And I just had this epiphany that what I needed to do was get on top of them in a boat. So I landed, I got the rental car and I start looking for a boat. I couldn't find a boat. 
Oh, and I also had to get uh, at least two wireless units, which I've never been wireless. Oh, before. yeah. And I got the wireless units, but couldn't find a boat. Found a <laughs> found a, a, a inflatable mattress. But I'm like, this isn't going to work. Someone's going to die if they do yeah. the inflatable mattress. No edges. But then I found a boat, and I rode the boat in Bellingham. And uh, after that, it was it was uh, it's kind of addicting to get on top of people in a boat. And so I did it ever since then. Wow. Uh, funny thing about that night, um, while I was playing, I heard this noise behind me, and uh, I turned around to look at the back of the stage, and the backstage is behind that. There's a wall, and suddenly a hole comes through the wall, and they're they're shoving the owner Aaron through this hole in the wall. He got drywall in his eyes, and they're just shoving him through this hole, and then he ended up getting up on the mattress on top of the people, but fell out of the mattress and hurt his back so bad that he couldn't um, he couldn't walk for like six months. I think he had to get surgery and all this stuff. And then the club closed and everyone was sad for Aaron. But then uh, about a couple months later, I was like, what's up with Aaron? And it turned out he was um, now the chef for Justin Timberlake and was touring the world cooking food for Justin Timberlake. And this is a guy I'd known for 10 years. And I was like, God damn, he never even made me a sandwich. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so then that story so then, went all kinds of places. Yeah, it did. Well, that sounds like one <laughs> crazy night. And so so it's basically been like 15 years now you've been riding the boat. And I can see why a boat is safer than a mattress. Like, yeah, you know, and, and really in a pinch. Um, there was a festival once in what was it, Belgium, and uh, I had to drive all night to get there. It was just, I was, had to go too far. So I drove all night. I got there at nine in the morning and then I wasn't playing until two in the afternoon. So I just inflated my boat and took a nap in it. Um, so it's actually very comfortable to sleep in. But then when I played at two in the afternoon, it was not a boatable crowd. So um, all the people in the backstage saw me do was drive up, get there at nine in the morning, take a nap in a boat, play a show, deflate my boat and leave. They thought I was just driving around with a boat to sleep in. That's, that's awesome. You're that guy. <laughs> sleeping sleeping in a boat. Um I will if I can. can what? Nice. You gotta try it sometimes. Sleeping in a boat. Sleeping in that could be a song, <laughs> sleeping in a boat. <laughs> what are some of the factors that make it for a really good show? Like either venue well, wise or Of course of course I like it to sound good and as much as I appreciate the chaos and everything, I do get there for sound check. I, I have a specific sound I'm going for. And it's best if I do sound check. I don't like just showing up and throwing the shit on stage and see what happens. I really want it to sound. I want to make it sound as good as possible. Because once I have it sounding as good as I can make it, and if it's working in the way that the sounds are designed to work, depending on the PA, you deal with what you got. Yeah. But if I got it dialed in where it's right, I will make that crowd go insane. So a good show for me is I get sounding good. But then we create some chaos, which causes mistakes to happen. I don't want a picture perfect show, every note played perfectly. To me, that would be boring. I want, I want something to go wrong. I want things to happen that it would not happen maybe the last time I was there, or even the next time I was there, or any other band there. I want things to go pretty much terribly wrong at some point. <laughs> and then if we bring it back to where we're still dancing after that, that's the best ever. Um, there's different ways to make that happen. Um, but the, the best way for that to happen is if the sound is, is good enough that the people start um, creating the chaos that I'm striving to help them create. And that being said, um, with other bands, if I go see a band, if something goes wrong, it's the best night ever for me. I don't want to see a picture perfect show. There was, there was this one show in Tucson. At, okay. um, what was it? Was it Seven Black Cats or Sterling Wench? Now I'm, oh, I'm confused. Yes. I don't remember I'm, which one. I'm Congress. But it yeah. was Deadbolt. It was a band Deadbolt. They were playing um, <laughs> the, the first song they came out and they broke the snare drum head. And Harley Davidson, the singer, was like, uh, anybody got a snare drum head? So it took 20 minutes. They changed the snare drum head. And the band just standing there. This, they tried to start the song again. Blam, first note, they broke a bass string. They're like, oh, has anybody got a bass string? Oh, oh no. People, started, people are leaving in droves. It's been like 30 minutes. They haven't even played a song. I'm sitting in the back. I was laughing so hard. It was the best night of my life. 
I never want to see Deadbolt play a full set again. I really enjoy it when things go terribly wrong. That's um, funny. It's just, yeah. I've been there. Perfect, I... music, perfect music bores me, but you know, that's just, that's just my opinion. Uh, music's so subjective, you know, there's no right or wrong answers to music. If you like that kind of jacket, then wear that kind of jacket. I'm not going to stop you, but I'm going to wear the kind of jacket I like. I had a show at Surly Wench and I was playing with both bands I was in. So opening with one band, then there was a middle band and then another band at the end. And similar thing happened where I, one of the first songs, my uh, bass drum pedal went through the skin of the, the bass drum. And I was like, <clears throat> like, ah, and like, I was like, what do I do? And luckily I did have uh, a skin kind of on the other side. And so we ended up flipping and flipping everything around. And so I got it to work out, but it was a little bit stressful, but it did, it's memorable. Like I'll always remember when that happened. There you go. And that, that's, I swear to God, more than half of this job is what's the plan B? Is if something breaks, you got two choices. You either stop or you fix it and go. And, um, and, and I wouldn't be doing this if there wasn't a, some kind of plan B came into my head when I suddenly lost my drummer. Um, yeah. That being said, like when I was 16, I saw, uh, I went to a Lola Palooza and this band came out and they started this song, but then their computer kind of broke. Then they tried to start again and they had a hissy fit. Then they just kicked everything off and ran away because the uh. computer broke. It was, it was nine inch nails. And, and to this day, I've never forgiven them. It's like they had drums, they had guitars. They could have done something. They didn't yeah. have to have a fit and run away because something broke. You, you figure it out. You know? yeah. And at this point, almost everything that could possibly go wrong with my setup has happened to me. So if something goes wrong, I can hear it. And I'll be like, I know exactly what that is. And I can crawl over and fix it. But every once in a while, to this day, I still get stumped. And um, one time, this wasn't, this was a little while ago, actually. Okay. But I was playing, and there were two girls sitting on me, and I was playing the song, and the drum stool broke, the legs broke off. So now oh. I was balancing on a, on a stick. And there was no legs. I was just balancing with two people sitting on me. Oh, my God. And I played this whole song. None of us fell. And at the end of the song, the people were clapping. And I was like, you guys should be clapping so much harder than that. You have no <laughs> idea what I just did. <laughs> oh my but that God. was just for me you know nobody really could tell that the drum stool broke you held, held it together <laughs> and well and i can tell you get quite a workout drumming is a workout anyway but but all the things you're playing then sometimes with people on you like you don't have to worry about i run and ride my bike and stuff you don't have to do any of that it seems like you have you release plenty of like energy and burn a lot of calories well, doing what you're for doing. me it's, it's a very physical thing and um i, I really you know, it's, again, it's my own fault. I'll be in the car yeah. saying, thinking to myself, how can I make myself sweat more? And, uh, you know, putting people on top of me, that's a good idea. All right, we'll try that. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, if it's a 300-pound German man, see, the thing is, when, when I'm playing guitar, yeah. my, my uh, not attitude, but just psyche, I don't know, something changes in me where I suddenly believe I can do anything. And even if it's something I've never done before, oh, I can do it because I'm playing guitar. So if a 300 person, 300 pound German man sits on my leg, that's not going to stop me. I'm going to, I'm going to bounce him. But then after the show, I can't walk. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Get but superpowers. As long as I'm playing guitar, I could, you know, I said this once before too. I'm approaching music like when, when you're a mom and a bus runs over your baby and you lift the bus off the baby, that's how I play guitar. Yeah. It's just this panic, save the baby, get the bus off the baby, and, and you do it even though you didn't know you could do it. And um, that kind of thing inspires me in real life as well. I mean, I love it when somebody does something impossible or um, really that they should not be able to do. Do, do you remember Carrie Strug? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Carrie Strug, right? Do you remember that? She did that jump with her broken ankle and yes. nailed that one foot landing? Yep. That, that still inspires me to this day. It's pretty amazing. And, and there's a million other things like that. But when, when somebody does something that just should not be possible, um, that's where my inspiration comes from. That's awesome. That leads me to actually, um, for younger, like, or just up and coming musicians, do you have any kind of tips or advice for them? Is there, there's um, so many people making stuff and and what are some tips to kind of, you know, get your music out there or maybe differentiate yourself? Well, I mean, I'm, I can say this, I'm old. 
<laughs> when I started playing music, we didn't have all the stuff that we have today, which is fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm totally happy selling um, digital music without mailing anything to anybody or booking shows through emails. You know, when I first started, you had to physically mail a letter to a club and include a cassette or, you know, whatever. Um, CDs were barely, had barely even started at that point. But um, the, the only, people say, how do I get to tour so much? You know, it's not, I, I didn't use the tools that I guess all the tools people have today. I still am only just starting on YouTube right now um, mm -hmm. with these birthday videos. For me, the, the only way I got to go everywhere and do everything was because I would go play a show somewhere mm -hmm. and I would play so, the, the show would be so good that people would talk about it to their friends. And then before too long, so I'd go play Atlanta and there'd be 12 people there and that's counting the other two bands. <laughs> then six months later, I go play Atlanta and it's 60 people. Nice. Not counting the other two bands. And I go back to Atlanta again less than a year later and it's 300 people. Wow. So my, my only advice is go somewhere, play the best show you possibly can, even if it's only to 12 people, mm -hmm. and then go back. And so many bands will make the first trip, they'll go play to 12 people and they go, oh, that sucked. And they give up and they don't go back. And I'm like, yeah. no, that's when you go back the most. If you played a great show in Atlanta to 12 people, go back there and all, all the people, but don't wait too long because they'll forget about you. Because don't forget, these people are drunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to go back kind of soon and just play good. I'll make this birthday song for Ken. And so I did it. And then um, my girlfriend showed me that her and her friends had bought a birthday video message from uh, like an English big brother dude. Like, I don't even know who this guy was. You yeah. Know, He's on the English Big Brother. We don't know who he is, but they, they know who he is. And they paid like 500 something dollars for this guy to say, hey, happy birthday, Lois. Don't get too drunk, ha. Huh? <laughs> you know, just the dumbest thing. And this thing to his phone. And I was like, 500 bucks? I can do way better than that. <laughs> so then um, I would get people to send me a list. And it's these ridiculous lists of things they like and a ridiculous list of things they don't like. And I pick up my guitar and I make something fun. And I just start shoving their lists into this fun guitar thing. And it turns into um, a birthday song, but only for that person. So it's like I'm making a song for one person and maybe their friends. But sometimes the lists are so ridiculous that the song will work for almost anybody. Um, and I've, I've been doing this. This has now become like a nine to five job for me. I'm doing so many birthday songs. I don't get days off anymore. Um, it's 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 totally insane, and every day is as crazy as the day before. Wow. Um, yeah, I just get to play around with people's likes and not likes with the fun guitar thing. It's like having a puzzle, but it's like a with malleable pieces, and if it doesn't fit, I can make it fit. <laughs> and I like, I mean, the one I and, just watched uh, that you posted, you know, some of the words in there like grandma and like rhubarb and. Uh, and then are you having oh. are you having fun with the graphics? Are you the one doing kind of the Photoshop work in the, these little videos? Well, no. So, um, yeah, that's um, pancakes, corn, and bighorn sheep. Oh, that pancakes, one, yes. Pancakes, corn, and bighorn yeah. sheep. Yeah, so um, I make the song, and then the people send me pictures, um, and I decide what I'm going to do to them. But I send my sister in um, Phoenix is the... Photoshop master. Nice. So I send her the pictures and I'll say, okay, Bonnie, put um, put Amy on a on a ostrich. Okay, now put Amy in a hot tub. Now yeah. put Amy in a hot tub with Lenny. And and so she does all that and then emails it back to me and then I edit it all in my phone. This is all done in the phone, you know. I'm not, For real? I'm not using any fancy equipment. This is like we all have everything I'm doing. You're carrying in your pocket right now. Wow. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm editing it on iMovie. Um, I'm recording it direct to my phone with the phone mic. Um, and I'm, I'm doing this all by the, what do you call it? By the seat of my pants. Yeah. But I've always approached music this way. You know, I don't ever want to be that kind of band. Like, well, we could do this album, but first we need this $5,000 worth of equipment and we got to get these special microphones. I say, screw that, hit your guitar case and sing into a telephone. Yes. and see how that works for you and if the song ain't good enough it's not going to be that much better if you got a good microphone and a real drum wow. <clears throat> so i've been taking all these um 
these ridiculous lists people send me for their birthday and then putting it together and getting it done and emailing it back to them so that they can show it to this person on their birthday. That's cool. And it's been um, the most ridiculous musical adventure I've almost ever been on. Um, from home? It's, it's, it's just nonstop, yeah, and it's all from home. It's all from home and in my, my fancy business office here. Yes. I got my business duck. That's my business boat. I got some business bread over here and some business balloons. That's awesome. And uh, my daughter's like, Papa, your office is crazy. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> it, it, it's, your, it's your birthday set. Um, and then you've put a bunch of these. So now you have a bunch of these. Like if you go on your Instagram, you can see a lot of your videos. And, and you're make, did you make kind of a, what's the word, like a collection now of them too? So yeah, I, I, there's, there's uh, I don't want, I didn't even know how many I've done now. It's, it's more than 150, uh, less, less than 200. Wow. But um, the ones that really work, I'm, I'm putting out on a record. And uh, so I've done volume one already, uh, some of the earlier ones and a few of the later ones. And volume two is almost ready. Uh, and I'll put that out as well. And they're, they're all just all on Bandcamp and iTunes. It's not like a physical album yet. Yeah. Um, that's but funny. yeah, you can you can download um, the best of the best birthday songs, volume one and volume two is coming soon. And yeah, I, I put the, all the songs that I do, they're all on YouTube or Facebook or Facebook pages or uh, Instagram. And uh, and they're free to watch. So you, you don't have to buy the record. You know, you can watch these all day for free. But uh, uh, with uh, Frank, Frank Mayer, Bear in a piece on there, he helped me uh, master them so That's that nice. they sound as good as possible for film recordings. Yeah. And if you want to support what I'm doing that way, yeah, you can buy the record on Bandcamp. Bandcamp, okay. Let's talk about Tucson for a sec. So how has Tucson been supportive of you as a musician? And how, what are some ways it's challenging? Well, I would not be doing this if it wasn't for Tucson, that's for sure. Um, Tucson was the greatest place to make music when I was, 17, 18, figuring stuff out. Um, this sounds strict. So Tucson was a place where maybe there wasn't as much to do as say like a city like New York or LA or Melbourne or something like that. It wasn't chock full of festivals and places to go and things to do. So I ended up being bored a lot of the time. And being bored is the best thing that ever happened to me because there was nothing to do. So I would pick up my guitar and just start playing it. And like, damn, I'm still bored. Well, I'm gonna play my guitar. And thinking, hey, look at me, I'm bored two years later. And I'm like, and then the year after that, I'm bored. I'm like, dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig -a. it was all because I was so bored that I got good at something. Um, I realized being bored can go the other way. You could end up getting horribly into drugs and robbing banks. But, but if you take it and write your book or paint your picture or get good at a guitar or piano or whatever it is you do, um, growing up in Tucson was the best thing that ever happened to me musically. And then also, um, well, one of the first guitars I got that I was doing this on um, was from Chicago store from Joe. I don't nice. know if you guys remember Joe, but he was a fabulous character. Tucson was so full of characters and I'm sure it still is. It still is, but yep. Joe, <laughs> Joe was one of a kind, and he, there was this this just homemade resonator guitar. With it was so homemade, it was like the F holes were carved with a butter knife. The pickup had an eighth inch jack to play, plug it. It was the most homemade guitar I've ever seen, and there was all kinds of things wrong with it. And I said, Joe, what the hell is this? And he turns around with me and says, That's a Gox. And I'm like, What's a Gox? And he said, That's God only knows. <laughs> <laughs> and it's this crappy guitar. I bought it and it made me make almost every song Durag ever did. It's um, when you got a guitar that's got something wrong with it, it makes you play differently, which makes you create something you would never have created on a perfectly um, meticulously kept perfect guitar. Um, so a lot of my guitars are guitars that nobody else could play or would play. Um, there was another place I was trying to remember this morning. I cannot remember the name of this guitar shop. It was in Tucson on Speedway. Oh. It was out towards um, guitars, et cetera. But metronome? Is it metronome? No, it's, this no. is before, way before metronome. Oh. So long ago. Yeah, this place is gone now. Oh. Um, but um, they had the uh, Kentucky Blue Silvertone. It's a it's a yellow and blue arch top, um, very cheaply made Silvertone guitar. 
and they had it hanging on the wall. And, and the action was too high for anybody to play. It's just the action was ridiculous. But I play slide, so action means nothing to me. <laughs> um, the action is how high the strings are from the neck, you know. Okay. And if you're playing with frets, you got to push the strings over the neck. If the action's too tall, that's really difficult to do. But I play slide, so give me that thing. So I go into that shop, and I sit down and play a little bit. And then I be home, and I just be thinking about it. Like, so a couple days later, I drive back out there and just play for a little bit. And I didn't have any money. I couldn't afford this thing. It wasn't even that expensive, but I just didn't have any money. Yeah. And I think after a couple weeks of this, the guy who worked there was like, man, just take it. You can play that thing so good. No one's ever going to buy it. Just take it. I want you to have it. Take it. Take it. Take it. And that was a Tucson thing to me. You know, yes. I'm sure that would happen other places. But Tucson musicians have always um, kind of had each other's backs, I think. I agree and with that. Growing up, we had the we had Steve I who did the DPC and um, the Dodaic, and he was just a music facilitator. He made it so all these young bands who were just learning stuff had a place to play, and maybe it was only for twenty people, but damn, did we have some good times! And there was just always something. Um, there was always a place to play in Tucson. It was easy. Whereas if you went to Phoenix, it would be much more difficult at that time. Now it's different in Phoenix, but at that time it was. Clubs in Phoenix were closing, coming and going all the time. There was just no specific spot to play music where Tucson had just always had that. And that was fantastic. Um, I, I always appreciate you brought up earlier about kind of the sound and how you always do sound check. And one thing as a, as a drummer too, I always appreciate when it was plush, how Dana that ran sound, like the system was great. And also I could hear myself really well. And you don't always have that um, where you go. So I think you always remember those venues that put that attention and time into like making their equipment as best as they can and helping you sound the best that you can. Um, Absolutely. When it sounds good to you, you, you do play a better show. But part of this job too is you got to learn what to do when it sounds so bad that you can't. And, and, and you, again, what do you do? Do you run away and not play yeah. or do you just deal with what you got? You deal. Um, there are some times though when, oh man. Okay, so I played this show in Serbia, this tiny town called Sambal, okay. in this town where no bands ever go. And I still don't know how the hell this happened. But I, I, I get there for sound check. The guy who's doing the board, he's never done sound before in his life. He's like, this is my brother's. I don't know how to work it. So I help him. We set it up. You know, I'm, I'm, I got it going. That's, I know what to do a little bit. We set it all up. And they gave me a bottle of whiskey. So I was like, I had one little sip and I gave him a sip because I thought that would be the nice thing to do. Yeah. Go change, give out the play. As soon as I sit down to play, the sound system's going, there's all these terrible noises. And I look and the sound guy is now turning every knob constantly because he, as a person who didn't know how to do sound, he thought doing sound meant you just turn the knobs. Oh. It's like, no, no, you set it and you leave it alone. But no, so he's turning every single knob and drinking from the whiskey and turning every single knob. And it was just every type of feedback known to man. Just, oh my God. just the whole 40 minute show. I finally finished the show. It was just, I just this sick feeling in my stomach. Just, I do not sound like that. It's the worst sound thing I've ever been a part of. And the owner of the club comes over to me and goes, we will never have a band play here again. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about that show is, is no matter where I've gone since, and if the sound ain't that good or the sound over here, something's wrong with this, I'm like, yeah, wasn't that great, but it wasn't as bad as Serbia. Yeah. <laughs> so now I've got this low bar set. So anything above that, I can deal with it. Nice. And, um, but when the sound is good, uh, it definitely helps you play a better show. And I know Dana. Dana actually was one of the first to live in my house when I moved to Australia. Oh. He's a fantastic man and a great yes. sound guy. Yes. Yeah. And now he's rocking it with his coffee shop, Decibel Coffee. He's like killing it. Oh, I did not know that. I'll have to come visit next time I'm in town. Yes. Get some good coffee. Is there any other music or books or podcasts or anything that you listen to or pay attention to for inspiration? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, since podcasts have happened, um, I love listening to podcasts when I'm on tour. That's like the best way to drive an eight hour drive. Um, I still listen to music, but music gets you along in three minute bursts. Yeah. Where a good podcast, you know, when it's done, you've driven for an hour. You know, it's amazing. 
What are some of your favorite um, podcasts? Well, there's of course there's the Radio Labs and the Revisionist History and things like that. Um, what is it? The oh, new one I like, Cautionary Tales. He's fantastic. That guy's amazing. Um, there's a oh, there's so many. Um, I, I'm kind of nerdy. I like the Imaginary Worlds one, which is um, that one's fantastic. A lot of what, science ones. What's that about <laughs> the Imaginary World one? You know that one? No. What's that about? No, it's great. It's just it's people that create their own universe, which is basically exactly what I've done. Wow. <laughs> Um, and speaking of creating your own universe, um, books-wise, uh, it's still my favorite, um, Don Quixote. Um, if you really look at that book, it, it actually is challenging and questioning the entire concept of what a book is. It's, you know, it's not, it's, it says there's no author. The author's writing how he finds it. So it is, there's no author to the book. Oh. Um, it's about a crazy man who puts on a fake helmet and tours the world fighting imaginary dragons. Does that sound familiar? Yes. So is that your inspiration? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Del Quixote is a major inspiration for me. Oh, that's cool. Um, and do you do any, uh, I guess you do podcasts. You also listen to audiobooks too? Not so much. Um, I, this is sort of embarrassing. Not really. I still occasionally will read um, a fiction book, but I don't know when it was. It was a while ago yeah. when I suddenly realized that fiction is nothing but a pack of lies. <laughs> <laughs> so I started reading more nonfiction books, um, which could still be a pack of lies, but um, some of them are so damn interesting. Oh, um, yeah. And Lucas Mosley uh, has gave me one of my favorites. He, he actually stumped me because I wasn't going to read it. He's like, you got to read this book. It's called Salt. Salt? And I'm like, Salt. Just Salt, yeah, by Mark Kurlansky. I'm like, I don't want to read a book on salt. That sounds like the most boring thing on planet Earth. It's the most incredible, amazing book. You can't put it down. And it's written in little snippets, so you just you could open it anywhere and, and learn 10 things a page that you had no idea. Nice. Um, yeah, I like archaic um, one-topic books, like The History of the Pineapple. That's another great one. Um, just straight-up pineapple. You think, how much can there possibly be? It's unbelievable, The yeah. History of the Pineapple. What wow. people used to do to get pineapples. It's just insane. And I, I love podcasts as well. And it's been fun doing this. Um, you know, we're, I'm trying to highlight talent out of Tucson. And what were some of the um, challenges of being a musician in Tucson? Um, I didn't really feel like I was challenged because I was in Tucson. I think it helped me more than anything. That's cool. Um, well, with the do-rag, we would just go play on the sidewalk. So when it was time to practice, we didn't just go to our house. and we just play for people on the street. Nice. And, and certain songs, certain songs, we would get a dollar every time we played it. And other songs, we would never get a dollar. Market research. <laughs> I still remember one time I was playing the song. And I'm, I'm kind of looking down, and I just see these shoes come up. They're stopping. They're looking at those shoes. Whoever shoes they were, they stopped to watch us play. And I'll look, and I'm like, those are cop shoes. That's a cop. A cop right in front of us. What's going to happen? Bam! Down came the dollar. Nice! Yeah. <laughs> that's good. So that's how I knew that song was good. That was a good song. <laughs> <laughs> Even the cop gave us a dollar. Something's up with that song. That's really good. Um, but yeah, Tucson, it was a... It never, I never felt that Tucson in any way hampered my, me being a musician. I think it gave, gave more to that. Because also, here's another thing. Yeah. Um, so I used to work at the Loft Cinema. Um, yep. I was a projectionist there for years. Cool. Um, but because I was living in Tucson, even though we didn't make any money, it was enough money where I still had three days or four days off a week where I could play guitar. Whereas if I had moved to LA, like some of, them, some of my friends, they were working six days a week just to be broke and maybe have two hours on the weekend to play guitar with their band or whatever. They had no time because they were constantly in the struggle to pay the rent. Um, in Tucson, you had time and time was such a huge plus um, for me as a musician taking it somewhere. And I would not have had that time, if, even if I'd lived in Phoenix or, or even a slightly bigger town. Tucson gave me the time to sit down with my guitar as much as I wanted to. So I'm so appreciative of that. I really am. Well, that's really cool. And that's a, that's a good point too, though. Like, 
the also the cost of living here is just so much more affordable and years ago I started my own graphic design business for a while and I would have never done that when I lived in Philly I I would have been intimidated I would have been no one would have known anything and I feel like Tucson has that small vibe where pe there's like that good word of mouth like you're saying like when you play a show people tell other people and you can really grow kind of your business or yeah your business in a place I think like this was there anything else that you wanted to share um with anyone on this podcast oh just um whatever you do don't stop doing it no matter what anybody tells you if you love doing it it's not work that's all I can really really say about it that's um awesome. for me playing guitar is the most fun thing I've ever done and uh, that's how I approach it every single day that's awesome well, um, how should people connect with you? Can you share uh, how, like, what social media or website um, they should look well, at? Well, sure. It's um, so if you just type Bob Blog into anything, all kinds of stuff comes up. So I'm on Facebook and uh, and Instagram, and there's a website b o b l o g one 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 dot com. Pretty easy. Um, I, my email comes up too. It's just Bob Blog one 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 at yahoo dot com. Um, yeah, send me a birthday list. I'll send you back a crazy song. Nice. That's awesome. I've already told a few other people about the, you might be getting some more birthday requests very soon. So you wouldn't believe how many people had a birthday August 15th. That was the most insane thing. I don't know what kind of worldwide humping yeah. was going on nine months from it, August 15th, but apparently, um, August 15th is a very popular birthday. Wow. Well, and, and with this quarantine situation, I bet in another nine months or so, there's going to be another burst of birthdays. I was thinking that. I hope by then I'm allowed out. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, you'll be, you'll be back touring by then. That'd be cool. I think so. That'd be good. Well, thank you so much, Bob, for taking the time and talking today. It was no such problem, a pleasure Julie. meeting you. It was nice meeting you too. I'll see you when I get back to town. Yes, sounds good. Thank you for listening today. This was such a fun conversation with Bob Blog. The key lessons that stand out include, number one, innovation. Bob's unique musical setup is very innovative. He didn't have a drummer, but still wanted to play music, so he created something new to be able to play, sing, and drum all at the same time. This innovative setup and his telephone sound is part of what makes him so unique. He's also very innovative in how he's dealt with being cooped up in Melbourne during the pandemic. Since he can't tour, he's grown the custom birthday song concept into a full-time job for the time being. What a great way to make some money and still be creating fun music for his fans. Number two, using structure to create chaos. I thought it was so interesting how much Bob values a good sound check. Not all musicians do, but it's part of the structure and experience he sets in place at his shows that he hopes will eventually turn into a bit of chaos. He said, a good show for me is to make sure the sound is good, but then we create some chaos, which causes mistakes to happen. I don't want a show where every note is played perfectly. To me, that would be boring. I want something to go wrong and then bring it back to where we're all still dancing. And number three, having a plan B. Bob mentions always having a plan B. Whether you don't have a drummer anymore, or someone sleeping in your kick drum, or you're surfing a crowd in a raft, you have to be a problem solver. You can tell he's living in the moment and knows the show must always go on. We appreciate you listening to the Old Pueblo New Economy podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please check out all of our episodes and series at www.oldpueblonewaconomy.com. While you're there, please make sure to sign up for our newsletter and receive upcoming episodes as they air. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for next week's episode.